They called it the Anubis Experiment. A perfectly ominous name for its purpose. Temporarily killing people in an insane attempt at contacting God. As it turns out, succeeding was the worst possible outcome for the project. And as their first and only subject, I was able to find the answers we so desperately sought after. And 20 minutes would be all I got. One of the more eccentric doctors at the facility had invented a new drug. He explained it as an antimatotic intravenous coolant. Something to stop my cells from dying. Not that these words meant anything to me. I was clueless, but ever so willing. It sounds crazy. Willingly putting yourself so close to the edge of life with no safety guarantee. But after being diagnosed with ALS, I was desperate for answers. My body was rapidly deteriorating, taking away parts of myself day by day. I had already lost the use of my legs, and eventually, I would be unable to feed myself or even breathe. The questions I had about the afterlife would be answered with the help of Dr. Mueller a man resembling more of a Frankenstein character rather than a legitimate medical doctor. He was eccentric as he was genius. With the promise of answers to the ultimate question, alongside a handsome paycheck, I was quick to sign up. I received a phone call from Dr. Mueller himself, only hours after signing up for the experiment. Speed never before seen at any regular clinic. He requested that I meet with a psychiatrist who would check out my mental state, weeding out any suicidal candidates and religious nuts. On the day of the experiment, I was hooked up to more cables than I had available skin surface. Various machines I couldn't even begin to understand were set up around me, providing alerting beeps to notify everybody that I was still alive. They would need to perform a craniotomy during the experiment opening up my skull and prodding around with electrodes to see if there was any activity going on while I was put under. Mueller had a small needle with a clear liquid. I thought it was funny how he had expected something more obvious to kill me. Perhaps a giant device containing green bubbly fluid that glowed in the dark or something to that effect. As it was, it just seemed a bit anticlimactic. This is going to hurt a lot. This is your last chance to turn back. Mueller said, calmly, knowing fully well I wouldn't give up. I had signed all of the papers and was fully briefed on the procedure, on the discomfort and the rehab and the time I would spend being put under a microscope, having every aspect of my being investigated. Pain was not something that I feared, but dying without answers would be pure torture. But you've already shaved my head. I joked. If I was going to die, I wanted my last words to at least be amusing ones. But nobody seemed to share that sentiment. Without further ado, they injected the substance into my arm. The second the liquid entered my vein, it burned like a colony of fire ants had crawled their way beneath my skin. Only a few seconds passed before my heart stopped. A moment of pain ensued, and then the darkness. People always talk about the white, blinding light they see during a near-death experience. The ecstatic feeling of peace and being back with loved ones. That's not what I experienced. I simply floated around in an endless void. Unhinged from the concept of time and space, not existing, nor worrying about getting back to life. Minutes, days, and years could have passed, and after an eternity in the void, I was jolted further into the beyond. Heaven or hell, I had moved on to the wrong side of life. The afterlight took the shape of a dimly lit room. I was standing up wearing the hospital gown I had died in, but my legs functioned again. I could move around on my own as if my disease never existed. I hadn't walked in over a year but I wasn't joyful about it. In fact, I couldn't experience any emotion. I simply existed with the endlessly large room, 
I'm not scared, or curious, or angry. Nothing. My naked feet felt wet as I moved across the floor. I couldn't recognize what it was made of, but it was soft, and it pulsated beneath me with every step. The way the room lit up was peculiar. There was no identifiable source of light, but everything appeared equally bright, as if each surface was lit up on its own. One spot shined brighter than the rest, a number written on the ceiling. 4,815,162,341 As I moved around, it became clear that the walls and ceilings narrowed in, to the point where it was no larger than a shipping container. In the confusion, I had not noticed a singular piece of furniture decorating the place, a bizarre chair made of flesh and bones. In the chair sat a young boy, emaciated, barely clinging onto life. Black tendrils connected him to the surrounding environment, with peristaltic movements surging away from him. The whole place was feeding off the child. Being there and seeing such a weak representation of life almost made me forget that I had just been killed. Yet I wasn't able to feel anything for the sickly looking boy. Hello? I asked quietly. The child slowly lifted his eyes towards me. His eyes were wide in a mixture of fear and surprise. How did you get here? He asked in a shaking voice. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I think I'm dead. I stuttered back. The words felt unreal as I spoke them. My memory was hazy. I could vaguely recall the experiment that I participated in and the lethal injection that Mueller had gave me. But it seemed more like a faint dream than a crucial part of my life. You're one of them. He asked nervously. One of... I couldn't finish. Somehow he knew what I was about to say. You're not supposed to be here. They'll find us. He got up from the chair, tearing the tendrils as he broke free. A thick black liquid flowing out from each end. He seemed surprisingly agile considering he consisted mostly of skin and bone. We have to get out of here. If you found your way here, then they could have followed you. What wait? Who are they? The creators. The boy pulled on my arm. His touch burned through my skin. I could feel the sensation of burning flesh, yet I couldn't feel the pain. Somehow the imprint looked nothing like the hand that had touched me. It was a strange symbol that I couldn't decipher. Hurry! We ran straight towards the wall, and as we approached it simply retracted into itself, and breaking apart to form a doorway, like with the tendrils and black ooze from the tears. The hallways inside were dark and moist, with barely enough space for an adult to bend over to get through. For each step and every time I leaned against the walls to support myself, it pulsated, and twitching reflexively with my movement. After a short run, we eventually entered a room exactly like the first one, except the number now read, 4,815,162,341. Are we safe here? No, but it'll buy us some time. So who exactly are we hiding from? Who are you? The child looked saddened by my question. I'm sorry, I did my best to hide you. Hide me? No, all of you. Humanity. What are you talking about? Shh. The child listened intently to the hallway we had just emerged from. The living wall was growing back over it, leaving no trace that a passageway had ever existed. Who are you? Without answering, the child grabbed my arm again, at exactly the same spot as before. Only this time, I could feel the burning sensation flowing through my veins, radiating up towards my neck. I felt joy unlike anything in my actual life 
and suddenly I knew what he wanted to tell me. For one moment, I both felt and I knew everything. You are God. I have asked and have stated. That's just one of the many names bestowed upon me by my own creation. But I'm not an infinite being like you believe. Why do you look like a child? Perception. Your mind created this form. My mind was racing. I couldn't even begin to process the answer to each question as they poured out of my mouth. What about heaven? Hell? Is this the afterlife? The boy just laughed. There is no heaven nor hell. That's a fantasy created by humanity. I made you because I believed you could be like me. But the creators had other plans. This is why I've been hiding you for so long. What plans? Because you are nothing more than slaves. And as soon as you have finished your time on Earth, you are used as spare parts so that the creators can exist in a physical form. They are so powerful, but wish for nothing more than to just live and feel everything that comes with being human. They need both your energy, which you creatively called a soul, and the remains, but I've been able to keep at least your energy hidden. How? By destroying it before it could reach me. I'm not sure how you got here. Maybe it's simply not your time. Or maybe somebody sent you here on purpose. But... Before I could keep my questionnaire going, I was interrupted. No more questions until you answer one of mine. That statement stopped me in my tracks. What could God possibly need to know from a nobody such as myself? How did you get here? Huh? There is an experiment by some doctor. He injected me with a drug that temporarily killed me. Why would you agree to that? They wanted me to find God. They wanted to find you. You fool. That's a horrible mistake. How could you not see? Anger and disappointment lit up in his eyes, burning through my soul like a raging fire. The shame and self-loathing had awoken me was unprecedented. I didn't have to ask any more questions. The information was being forced into my mind. Unrelenting amounts of knowledge occupied my every thought. Despite being dead, the pain was still ever so real. God showed me the face of the creators. He showed me what they do with us after we die. They take what remains. Our souls, our flesh and it allows them to temporarily walk among us on Earth, disguised as friends, co-workers, and politicians, and doctors with a penchant for obsessive experiments. Do not tell them anything. It would be the last words he ever spoke to me. No sooner had he spoken these words, before something jolted me away, pulling me back through the void with incredible force. And before I could process what was happening, I awoke with a gasp in my own body, lying in a hospital bed back in the real world. You're awake! And Dr. Mueller exclaimed in joy as he saw me open my eyes. Though I hadn't been dead long, 19 minutes to be exact, the experiment had put me into a coma for three weeks following the injection. I didn't speak. I just kept my mouth shut while I tried to figure out if it had all just been a vivid nightmare. They did all sorts of cognitive tests during the next couple of days, making sure my brain hadn't melted due to the 19 minutes of death that I experienced. Whatever their machines did, they detected a lot of activity while I was under, the things they wouldn't see in an average dead individual. For weeks after my physical health was established, they prodded and they asked me for anything, but I did as the child had told me. I kept silent only providing unimportant details about what I saw. I told them that there was a light, that I felt at peace and all the other mumble-jumble people say at a near-death experience. Eventually they gave up and they sent me home, telling me that they would stay in touch and to call if I could remember anything useful. 
Until I got home, I couldn't be sure whether the whole ordeal had been a creation of my own dying mind, or if it had truly happened. But one thing I brought with me back from the afterlife was the ability to walk. There is no cure for ALS, but somehow my body had healed, a fact that didn't remain hidden for long. The miracle of regaining my ability to walk and I'll quickly gain some media attention. So I took what little money I had saved up and I started running, hoping that they, the creators, wouldn't find me. The only way to get away from them is to die, to let God destroy my soul. A year ago, I would have happily killed myself to escape whatever torture they have ready for me. But death has become a terrifying concept. Because I know there is nothing left for us on the other side.